you spoke about the U.S. president in sports in January and women in sports in the month of March. And today it'll be about American territories. But before we get there, we just want to let everyone know. I heard like a phone ring somewhere. Okay. Uh, that you are a well-respected presenter. You are an author of 11 books, most of them on politics and sports. You're a journalist. You have a background in radio and television, conduct a video podcast, an avid reader and researcher, and you cover a wide range of topics, usually dealing on sports, policy, regulation, and politics. And politics. So um, I welcome you back again, uh, and we are thrilled that you are going to talk about this topic that's actually in the news uh, within these days, very recent days, and will continue to be in the news for a while. So welcome, Evan Wiener, and thank you. Uh, thank you, Anna, and thank uh, everybody else for being here this afternoon. My name is Evan Wiener, and I've been a journalist since I'm 15 years old, 1971, if you want to do the math. Spring Valley High School uh, in 11th grade. I started on WRKL radio up in Rockland County. And uh, I've been to some of these territories, a uh, good number of these territories, and uh, not every United States citizen is equal. If you're part of the 50 states, you have an advantage over people in Washington, D.C., or in Puerto Rico, or in the Virgin Islands, or in Guam. You're full citizens. You're not quite full citizens in territories and in the federal district. Now, there is a difference between the U.S. territory and the federal district. The federal district, of course, Washington, D.C. I was in the Virgin Islands. I speak on cruise ships uh, in 2017, and uh, I took a picture of this license plate saying, you know, I, I kind of do this talk. I haven't done this talk in a while on the cruise ship about four or five years. But if they ever ask me to do this again on a cruise ship, I got the Virgin Islands of the United States 100th anniversary of the transfer centennial uh, when the United States uh, bought the islands because of World War I. Get into that in a couple of minutes. Um, the United States, the district. Well, I talked about territories and the federal district, two separate entities. The federal district actually has electoral votes uh, in the United States presidential election. The territories don't. Uh, in 1790, Maryland and Virginia. Now, if you got to go back to Jefferson and Hamilton, and if you saw the play Hamilton, you know that Hamilton wanted to keep the financial capital of the United States in New York because he wanted to keep the money. And uh, Jefferson wanted to move the capital and the capital would be moving around it be in Philadelphia uh, and some other places, Princeton, New Jersey for a little while. Eventually it would settle to the swamp, the swamp lands off the Potomac River, uh, Maryland and Virginia. So uh, there was a compromise between Hamilton and Jefferson. Hamilton keeps the money in New York. Jefferson gets his capital in Maryland and Virginia, it's not yet called uh, Washington. It is called the District of Columbia. And in 1790, Maryland and Virginia secede or ceded about 10 miles of territory to establish the District of Columbia as the capital of the United States. Uh, there were about 3,000 people who were living in DC at the time. And uh, white men who uh, owned property at that time continued to vote. Uh, either in Maryland or Virginia, as they did before. Uh, the Washington, D.C. city is a federal district. It's not a territory. Uh, Washington, Washingtonians, uh, the residents there have more rights than, say, territorial residents. But uh, the federal government does limit local power, calls many shots. Uh, for instance, if you're building say, uh, a baseball stadium for the Washington Nationals, or going back to 1961, uh, a baseball stadium and a football stadium for then the Senators and George Preston Marshall's NFL team, they built it. And it was their rules, not local rules. So if you're building things in Washington, you got to go through the federal government. And that's not necessarily a thing that 
Washingtonians want. Uh, there is Washington, D.C., when the uh, Capitol was undergoing some uh, reconstruction on the rotunda. Uh, territories have always been part of the United States uh, by the Act of Congress. The term United States, when used in a geographical sense, means the continental United States, Alaska, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, Guam, the Virgin Islands, and also Washington, D.C., but some Americans aren't as equal as other Americans. Right now, there are 16 U.S. territories, one federal district, Washington. Uh, the 16 U.S. territories, Puerto Rico, Guam, uh, the Northern uh, Mariana Islands, the U.S. Virgin Islands, and American Samoa, they are in inhabited. The other territories are not. More than 3.5 million Americans cannot vote in presidential elections because they live in one of the territories, which Puerto Rico, Guam, the Northern uh, Mariana Islands, American Samoa, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, of course, people in Washington, D.C. can vote, and their vote does count in the Electoral College. Guam is a key military outpost in the Pacific Ocean. Not fully American. So those territories are organized, self-governing territories with locally elected governors and territorial legislatures. Uh, each also elects a non-voting member to the U.S. House of Representatives. Uh, people in the U.S. territories cannot vote for the President of the United States. They do not have full representation in Congress. The idea of territories or United States territories is not new. It's been around virtually since the country started. And there is uh, a late November sunset uh, in Washington, D.C., looking west at uh, the Washington Monument. Uh, the Senate is now playing around with a Washington, D.C. becoming a state amendment. There are 46 Democrats who have endorsed the Washington, D.C. Admissions Act. Uh, that was introduced by the D.C. delegate to the House, Eleanor Holmes Norton, in 2019, again in 2021. Uh, the bill's already in trouble because the West Virginia Democrat Joe Manchin uh, doesn't really think that uh, the Senate should be deciding whether or not uh, Washington should be a state or city-state because uh, he said something mumbo-jumbo about uh, the Founding Fathers, but um, who really knows what the Founding Fathers really thought other than what's in their writings? Uh, so he thinks that perhaps um, the people in D.C. should vote upon it, but they have. They want statehood. Uh, the bill is designed, uh, the uh, Eleanor Holmes Norton bill is designed uh, to grant Washington, D.C. admission into uh, the Union as a state and would become the country's first and only city state. It's a political battle. Uh, it's always been a political battle because the balance of the Senate uh, is always seemingly uh, in play whenever any of these states become, or territories like Alaska and Hawaii back in 59 and 60, uh, become states. The uh, 59, 60, uh, when Alaska came in as a 49th state, people thought, well, hey, they were going to be uh, Republican. Does Puerto Rico ever vote for U.S. president? No, no. Uh, anyway, um, and they thought Alaska would be Democrat and Hawaii would be Republican. It actually flipped with Alaska being mostly Republican and Hawaii being Democrat. So there's always that political calculus um, when you add a state, and no state has been added since uh, Hawaii back 61 years ago. Um, so right now, a lot of Democrats are saying, yeah, let's make it a state. The Republicans are totally against it. That's the political calculus, because having Washington, D.C. come in would tip the balance of power to the Democrats, because Washington, D.C. overwhelmingly votes Democrats locally uh, and also in presidential elections. So there would be two additional senators, one House member, and the Republicans aren't too keen on uh, establishing two new senators uh, and making 102 senators. Uh, the district, well, the argument is that the district is way too small to be a state. It's only 10 square miles. But if you look at it, Washington, D.C. has about 700,000 residents. Wyoming has 580,000 residents. Vermont 
624,000 residents. And four other states have fewer than a million, Alaska, North and South Dakota, and Delaware. So these arguments don't necessarily fly. Yeah, it's small, but you know, okay. So is Rhode Island. That's small too. Uh, Washingtonians want statehood. Rights in non-rights, as we look at the Washington Monument and the Smithsonian Institute, the old castle uh, over there on the mall. In 1801, Congress passed the District of Columbia Organic Act, which formally placed the government of the District of Columbia under control of Congress. What that meant was that the citizens living in the district no longer were residents of Maryland or Virginia, no longer had representation in Congress. Uh, but the 23rd Amendment of the United States Constitution, ratified in 1961, uh, District of Columbia is treated as a state for the purpose of the presidential election, except it cannot have more electoral votes than the state with the least number of electors, which is three. And there are a bunch of states with just three, like Alaska. So in one sense, yeah, it's a state. On the other sense, no, you're not a state because we're afraid that you may have representation in the Senate, which could alter the balance of the Senate. Uh, in 1993, a uh, previous bid for uh, statehood uh, was defeated in the House of Representatives, which was Democrat democratically controlled to the one in 1993. Bill Clinton stayed out of the debate. But I have a friend, Jim Williams, whose wife, uh, Susan Miller, Dr. Susan Miller, who uh, is a liaison to Congress, CDC, actually working on the COVID-19 uh, response, said that Bill Clinton used to get really upset when he used to see that license plate representation, uh, uh, this one, taxation without representation, the unofficial slogan of Washington, D.C., taxation without representation and Clinton used to, did not like seeing that license plate because he knew it was true. Uh, the existing area of Washington, D.C., if it would become a state, uh, would be named Washington Douglas Commonwealth. And there would be a new federal district that would be carved out or created within the boundaries of the new state. It'd be a very small federal district, but it would be a federal district. To be called the capital, the new district would encompass the White House, the United States Capitol building, the United States Supreme Court building, some federal buildings and other uh, federal monuments adjacent to the Capitol and the mall. If you've been down to Washington, it is the distance between the Lincoln Memorial and the Capitol building. That would be the entire capital of the United States. And um, that would be it. The rest of the city would be controlled by a governor. And um, that would be in there, uh, the Washington Monument. But where, where I'm standing right there, uh, which is in front of uh, the uh, Thomas Jefferson Memorial, might not be. Might not be. Depends on how they carve it up. Uh, the John A. Wilson Building is excluded from the Capitol. It would serve as the state capital of Washington. Uh, and the new state would elect two members to the Senate and one to the House of Representatives. The current local representatives, the mayor and the city council, would transition to governor and state legislature. And as I said, the state is mulling over whether Washington, D.C. should be a state. There's a long, long history of uh, people actually being afraid of making them a state because of political representation. And uh, that would be a great topic for somebody just to talk about for an hour. San Juan, that is a view from a cruise ship of uh, the fort that overlooks, uh, or the citadel, that overlooks San Juan. And you can see it's built up somewhat uh, to protect the uh, edge of the island. Uh, Puerto Rico is a United States territory. When it comes to sports though, it's an international competitor in the Olympics with teams representing Puerto Rico. How's that work? Puerto Ricans are American citizens. And yet, according to the International Olympic Committee, Puerto Rico is an individual nation. It's a nation in terms of how it competes in the Olympics. Uh, uh, this is a United States colony, or was a United States colony, and then became a territory. 
And uh, remember the War of 1898, and I'll put on my journalism uh, cap here and talk about uh, uh, William Randolph Hearst, who basically was pushing for the War of uh, 1898. You supply the war, we'll supply the pictures, said the uh, newspaper magnate who owned a bunch of newspapers around the United States. Uh, anyway, Spain ceded the island and the Philippines to the United States as a result of its defeat in the Spanish-American War under the terms of the Treaty of Paris of 1898. And there is a, a better look at uh, the Ford or the Senegal uh, up uh, in uh, San Juan. Uh, in 1917, this is 19 years after the United States gets the, uh, the well, it's a colony, it becomes a territory. Uh, the U.S. granted citizenship to the residents of Puerto Rico. But it wasn't until the Nationality Act of 1940 that all people born in Puerto Rico were designated citizens by birthright, uh, birthright regardless of their uh, parentage. Meanwhile, even though Puerto Ricans didn't really have full rights as a citizen, it served in World War I and in World War II. Since 1948, uh, Puerto Rico, has uh, elected their own governor. 1952, there was a constitution of Puerto Rico that was adopted and ratified by the electorate. Uh, another picture of San Juan on a ship. Uh, Puerto Rico was granted U.S. Commonwealth status in 1952. Uh, Puerto Ricans enjoy U.S. citizenship, except they can't vote in federal elections. And they do have access to Social Security and Medicare. But the island is kind of in a really strange situation. Uh, there aren't too many people who want to continue the Commonwealth slash territorial status, uh, but where do they go? Do they go to statehood? Well, yeah, they could go to statehood, I suppose, or they could become independent. And it's rather dicey to become independent when you don't have that many uh, resources, um, because if you look all around the Caribbean, uh, there's a lot of hardship around the Caribbean, particularly during hurricane season. And there is downtown uh, San Juan, and that's a, um, a, a musician uh, who used to play in downtown San Juan that I decided to take a picture with. Uh, it's very complicated, very, very complicated in Puerto Rico. The Puerto Rico State uh, Hood Admissions Act uh, was introduced just recently by um, their shadow uh, representative Soto. And uh, a Puerto Rico resident commissioner, Jennifer Gonzalez Colon, and that would require Congress to vote on whether to admit Puerto Rico as a state and uh, passage of one final referendum of Puerto Rican voters to accept or decline Congress's offer of statehood. Uh, there were hearings on April 14th of this year as to why Puerto Rico should be a state. So right now that's even in limbo. Um, until they get the act together on the island, until they lobby Congress uh, and, and the Senate to figure out whether or not uh, Puerto Rico should be uh, a state. Uh, Puerto Rico has 3 million uh, citizens, American citizens, and that's more than about 20 states. Uh, I think uh, the math was two senators and four members of the House of Representatives if they come in. So here are the possibilities. Statehood, continuing status quo, which most people don't want, and independence. But most Caribbean countries uh, that are independent are struggling to survive economically. Uh, the Senate and Congress have been extraordinarily slow to act on Puerto Rico's future. Uh, Puerto Rican citizens don't exactly know what they want to do either. Uh, there was a referendum back in November, November 2020, and uh, this was the this was a referendum, simple yes or no question. Should Puerto Rico be admitted immediately into the union as a state? And look, it's pretty close. Six hundred fifty-five thousand five hundred five said yes to statehood, fifty-two point five two percent. Five hundred ninety-two thousand six hundred seventy-one votes opposed it. So it's really close, really, really close. Uh, as to what uh, Puerto Rico wants. Uh, meanwhile, just east of Puerto Rico is St. John's, Virgin Islands. 
uh, and St. Croix and St. Thomas, the three islands that the United States got in 1917. Uh, the, on the on the onset of World War I, there were reforms um, to close and uh, leave the islands isolated um, by Denmark. Uh, but uh, there, this is a time of submarine warfare in the first phases of World War I, and the United States is looking at these islands, which aren't that far from its colony in Puerto Rico, and really not too far from the United States, and uh, they're looking at it and they said, hmm, you know what, Germany could seize these islands and set them up as submarine bases. And uh, hey, you know what, why don't we see if Denmark wants to sell them? And uh, there were some negotiations and then eventually Denmark says, yeah, give us $25 billion. And uh, the United States gave them $25 million in gold. And, the Virgin Islands became part of the United States. And this is basically what the Virgin Islands is about. Tourism, beaches, um, cruise ships, planes, having a good time, particularly uh, before the hurricanes over in St. John, which is less developed than uh, St. Thomas. Uh, the deal was finalized January 17th, 1917. Uh, when the United States and Denmark exchanged their representative treaty ramifications. <coughs> Excuse me here. The United States took possession of the islands on March 31st, 1917, and the territory was renamed Virgin Islands of the United States, which is adjacent to the Virgin Islands of Britain. And again, this is what uh, the Virgin Islands, it's beautiful. You just go to the beach, uh, Megan's Bay and, and other beaches that uh, I've gone to uh, over the years being on cruise ships and um, you go swimming and it's tourism and that's basically what drives the island. Uh, unlike Washington DC, unlike Puerto Rico, there has never really been a push for statehood. Um, the Virgin Islands looked at becoming a state in 1984, well no big deal. And uh, there was a referendum in 1993, but uh, nobody seem, seemed at that point to be too interested in becoming a state. And uh, it's out there, um, vacation paradise. Uh, and, uh, but right now, nobody's pushing for statehood. Meanwhile, Guam, which is in the uh, Pacific Ocean, and it's a key American military installation, and it's also closest to North Korea. If you might remember a couple of years ago, uh, people in Guam were saying, hey, you know, this guy, uh, Kim, up in uh, North Korea, he can actually reach us with his atomic or his nuclear weapons. Um, this is where the American day begins. Uh, during the Spanish-American War of uh, 1898, which we just spoke about, the United States captured Guam. And under the Treaty of Paris, signed December 10th, 1898, Spain ceded Guam to the U.S., effective April 11th. 1899. After World War II, and you're talking now at this point 46, 47, actually 51 years, the Guam Organic Act 1950 established Guam as an unincorporated organized territory of the United States, which provided for the structure of the island's civilian government and granted the people U.S. citizenship. The governor of Guam was federally appointed until 1968. Now there is an election, popular election, to elect a governor. Uh, the Pacific hotspots are nearby, and that's why the United States has a heavy military uh, presence on Guam. Uh, the Pentagon is planning to relocate uh, thousands of troops stationed on the southern Japanese island of Okinawa to Guam. Guam is uh, close to North Korea, close to China. In 2017, Guam was on the alert for a possible North Korean nuclear attack. Uh, all Guam is is a 30 mile long tropical island. About 160,000 people live there in addition to the uh, large Air Force and Naval bases. And basically, again, uh, this is a territory where the number one industry aside from military is tourism and vacation. Uh, statehood would give Guam all the rights and, of course, the burdens of being a state, although it would be a very small one. 
and uh, free association with administrative power like uh, Palo and the Marshall Islands. Uh, independence would make Guam a minuscule sovereign state. And near Guam is the Northern Mariara Islands. And uh, again, here you go. There's somebody. I've never been to Guam or, or the Northern Mariara Islands. Uh, again, it's, uh, it's cruise ship friendly. Um, we almost got to go to Guam a couple of years ago um, on a cruise ship, uh, but um, it was just too much of a hassle getting uh, catching the cruise ship in the South Pacific. Uh, the Commonwealth of uh, the Northern Mariara Islands, uh, a self-governing -gover commonwealth in association with the United States, 22 islands, inlets in the Western Pacific Ocean. Uh, it's part of the Mariana Islands. It's a chain of volcanic mountain peaks and uplifted coral reefs. Uh, and it also includes the politically separated island of Guam to the south. Uh, the Northern Mariana Islands uh, emerged from the trust territory of the Pacific Islands, from which the United States administered, or the United States administered on behalf of the United Nations from 1947 until Palau, uh, the last member of the uh, TTPI, uh, to choose its uh, political future, became an independent country in 1994. Uh, the federal law making uh, CM, I'm CNMI, a U.S. territory, Northern uh, Mariana Islands, uh, passed in 1975. Uh, there was also uh, Sepan, and uh, that's part of it. Uh, the uh, CM, CNMI adopted the Constitution in 1977. Uh, the first constitutional government took effect in 1978, uh, and it became uh, under federal minimum war, uh, minimum wage regulations in 2007, and immigration law in 2008. And uh, in June of 2009, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security took over the immigration and border controls of the CNMI. Uh, the representation, well, the Northern Mariana Islands does not have voting representation in the United States Congress, but since 2009, uh, there has been uh, some representation by a delegate who can participate in the debate, but can't vote on anything on the floor. Uh, the Commonwealth has no representation in the U.S. Senate. And here is American Samoa. And it's unincorporated, unorganized territory of the United States. The United States has not provided an organic or charter act setting it forth with a system of government. It's just American in name only for the most part. The U.S. Secretary of the Interior has jurisdiction over the territory and, or had from um, 1951 until uh, 1967. And then Constitution was written. Uh, the United States, uh, they don't have citizens there. They're U.S. nationals, and they can't come to the United States and reside in the United States, but they got to go through a citizenship pro uh, a process. So even though American Samoa has America in the name, or American in the name, the uh, people who live there are not U.S. citizens. Um, the American Samoa Territory uh, became part of the U.S. by deed of secession. Starting in 1900, the Matai, or the local chiefs of the Tutela, which is the largest island, ceded the uh, island to uh, the United States in um, 1900. Uh, what is the difference between the territory and the Commonwealth? Uh, well, um, nothing, <laughs> nothing really, other than uh, American Samoa uh, has no uh, voting rights, um, uh, or rather their nationals, they, they really don't have voting rights. Uh, let me get this in check. Samoa is in the Pacific. It is in the Pacific. Um, so um, American Samoa by 1925 is all part of America by 1925. And uh, it was the Navy that oversaw the territory until 1951. Uh, but they don't have that kind of, or they don't have uh, voting rights there or any kind of rights. They're not even citizens. That's the United States. 
Uh, if you look at the map in the United States, you re may remember the 13 original colonies uh, were, uh, well, it wasn't Maine and it wasn't Vermont. Maine was part of the Massachusetts. Vermont was an independent republic. So the 13 original colonies were New Hampshire, Massachusetts, which had Maine, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware, Virginia, which actually owned the land that's now known as West Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. Uh, and that was it. Those were the 13 colonies, and they were known as the uh, Southern colonies to the Brits. And uh, north uh, of uh, Maine uh, was uh, Nova Scotia, which, is, which was cut in half after the Revolutionary War, so people escaping. Uh, could go up to New Brunswick uh, and be safe from the Americans. And uh, so that was it. The rest of the United States was once territories. Some territories existed only a short time before coming states, while others remained territory for decades. The shortest lived territory was in Alabama, two years. The New Mexico Territory and the Hawaiian Territory lasted more than 50 years. Uh, and now you look at it, Puerto Rico has lasted uh, 123 years, um, uh, the Virgin Islands 104 years, so they've lasted longer than those territories. And uh, back in the day, it seemed fairly easy to make the leap from territory to state. There wasn't all this horse trading work, or was there, about uh, the control in the Senate. Yeah, you would think they wouldn't be that much worried, but let's talk about that a little bit. First of all, Vermont. That's Bennington, Vermont. And um, Vermont was an independent republic at one time. In the uh, early 1700s, the royal governors of New Hampshire and New York, the Brits, made land grants to settlers in an area that would later become Vermont. The king you know, whether it's King Charles III or whatever, had to settle the matter of which colony had the right to land grants. Was it New York or was it New Hampshire? The king would eventually rule that, oh, Vermont, you're part of New York. Well, the Vermont people said, no, we're, you know, we're New York, we're New Hampshire grants. And, you know, look at the area. It all looks like up there. Uh, that's Vermont. You got the Adirondacks to the uh, west and you got the mountains to the east. The area all looked alike. Um, but the main reason for declaring independence as far as Vermont went, um, you know, they, they just didn't want to be part of New York. In fact, there are a couple of things written into uh, the agreement that made Vermont the 14th state, which means they could go back to being a country if they wanted to. I don't think that's going to happen, but they could. Uh, because of the Revolutionary War, New York said, you know what, you want to go, goodbye, farewell. You know, don't let the door hit you on the way out. Uh, during the American Revolution, Vermont declared itself an independent country, separate from the original 13 colonies. But the Continental Congress said, no, 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 you're still part of us. And they're saying, no, we're not part of us. Uh, during the revolution, Ethan Allen, before he became the furniture guy, Ethan Allen and some other politicians approached the British-controlled Quebec and said, Hey, wait a minute. Uh, you want to you want to join us here? You know, it'd be great. You know, have all of Quebec, um, and um, you know, and Vermont will be one state, all part of the United States. But the Quebecois said no. Um, and if you know anything about the history of the Quebecois, they were uh, given the French French Catholics were given the right to practice their own religion and their own language. Uh, so they stayed with the Brits. Um, they were rebuffed pending the outcome of the war. Uh, Vermont, site of the Catamount uh, Tavern, 1767. Uh, Vermont outlawed slavery, granted the right to vote to all adult males. You gotta remember, when the United States was founded, the only people who could vote were property owners. Um, and uh, in terms of slavery, well, no, you can't have slaves. Vermont issued its own money and had its own postal service. Uh, finally, Vermont gave in and uh, joins the United States as the 14th state in 1790, 14 years after being an independent republic. The Mississippi Territory, there is Biloxi, Mississippi. 
the Mississippi, Alabama area. The Mississippi Territory, created by Congress in 1798, was a strip of land extending about 100 miles north to south and from the Mississippi River to the Georgia border. The territory was increased in 1804 and in 1812 to reach Tennessee down to the Gulf of Mexico. So you got two sizable areas that could become states. Uh, and there is uh, Alabama as well. Uh, in 1870, the western part of the state, which became Mississippi, achieved statehood. The eastern part of the state became Alabama in 1819. Rather easy. Uh, the Louisiana Territory. This was the uh, area that was picked up, and then there's uh, the Gulf of, that's the Mississippi River as you head into New Orleans. Uh, the Louisiana Territory was picked up in 1803. Thomas Jefferson bought it from the French and Napoleon, who needed money because he's fighting all kinds of wars in Europe. Uh, and uh, it would become a number of states. The Territory of Louisiana, or the Louisiana Territory, was organized uh, into an uh, incorporated territory of the United States, and that only lasted from July 4th. Uh, 1805 to July 4th, or June 4th rather, uh, 1812, uh, only about seven years when it was renamed the Missouri Territory uh, because states were beginning to be carved out of it. Uh, throughout most of the U.S. history, regions were admitted to, as territories prior to uh, becoming states or parts of territories of that kind. As the United States grew, the most populous parts of an organized territory would achieve statehood. It wasn't all that difficult. You got people? Good. Come on in. And by the way, back in those days, um, the United States senators were interested in expanding west and west and west and west and west. In fact, uh, the War of uh, 1812, part of it was because uh, the United States wanted to continue to expand northward. Uh, Montana was part of that deal. Believe it or not, Montana was part of the Louisiana Purchase, uh, the Continental Divide uh, uh, up in Glacier National Park, where it was about 32 degrees and the fog was thick when we took that picture. Louisiana, Missouri, Arkansas, Iowa, North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, Oklahoma. In addition, the area included most of the land in Kansas, Colorado, Wyoming, Montana, and Minnesota. Huge, huge area. Huge, huge area. And uh, of course, the United States uh, would increase in size. Maine. Remember when I said it was pretty easy uh, that uh, people came in, they didn't really worry too much about uh, the makeup of the Senate? Well, Maine uh, is one of those areas uh, that uh, there was um, some question, and uh, you might go back to your history books for this one. It's called the Missouri Compromise. In 1819, the United States contained 11 free and 11 slave states. And uh, if you allow Missouri to come in, well, it becomes 12 slave states and 11 free states. So what are we going to do? Oh, okay. We'll let Missouri in and it'll come into the Union as a slave state, but we got to balance it out. Oh, those people up in Massachusetts, north of Massachusetts, east of um, New Hampshire, and that 10 miles that separates uh, Massachusetts from Maine, there's a little 10 mile stretch there uh, on the water. Um, Maine, they don't want to be part of Massachusetts. Hey, let's let them go. We'll let them go, and then everything is even you'll have 12 and 12. And the Missouri Compromise was just that. Uh, Missouri was a territory, or part of the territory of Louisiana Territory, then the Missouri Territory. And uh, Maine was part of the Massachusetts. And Maine got out of it. The Florida Territory, roughly the same time. The territory of Florida was organized and incorporated. Uh, territory of the United States, it existed between March 30th 1822, and uh, I guarantee you there wasn't a high rise there uh, in uh, Fort Lauderdale, one of my pictures from one of the cruises. Anyway, uh, existed from March 30th, 1822 until March 3rd, 1845, which coincidentally 
uh, was the inauguration of John Tyler as president on March 3rd, 1845. Uh, and it's admitted to the Union as the state of Florida. And that's uh, Jupiter, Florida, the lighthouse in Jupiter. It was originally called La Florida, Spanish territory. And uh, later, uh, it was East and West Florida. It was ceded to the United States as part of the Adams Unes Treaty, governed by the uh, Florida Territorial Council, and uh, became a state later on. The Oregon Territory. The Oregon Territory is uh, a little different. Uh, Portland, Oregon. Keep Portland weird. Dante's live music on Burnside. It is a weird place, Portland. Um, now. How did the Portland, Oregon Territory, or as they say up there, Oregon, how'd that come to be? Well, this is part of the uh, border uh, that uh, the United States and England carved out with that territory north of the border that we now know as Canada. Uh, the Webster-Ashburton Treaty of 1842 partially delineated the northeastern U.S. Canadian border, but left out uh, the uh, Oregon Territory, which seeped into British Columbia, or British Columbia seeped into there. This is an interesting uh, little tidbit that not too many people really talk about uh, in the Oregon Territory. In 1844, every African American person was ordered to get out of the Oregon Territory, which was a very expansive territory that stretched from the Rocky Mountains to the Pacific Coast into the English area. Uh, south toward California. And um, the African Americans who refused to leave could be severely whipped, the provisional government law declared, and not less than 20 or more than 39 stripes to be repeated every six months until they left. Fortunately, no black person was ever lashed. Uh, it existed from August 14th, 1848, to February 14, 1859. The southwestern portion of the territory was uh, admitted to the Union as the state of Oregon. And again, no African Americans allowed there. Uh, the region uh, eventually uh, north of it would be divided between the UK and the US in 1846. The United States area would include the states of Oregon, Washington, Idaho, parts of Wyoming, and Montana and uh, the Brits kept uh, British Columbia for themselves and uh, may have uh, been a part of uh, Alberta as well. Because if you look at the 49th parallel, that's where it was carved up on the 49th parallel, which goes from roughly Lake Superior out to the Pacific Ocean. That is the New Mexico Territory. Um, they would both come in as states. Uh, that was a territory that was uh, seized during um, one of the wars um, in, uh, with uh, Mexico. Uh, the territory of New Mexico was an organized incor incorporated territory. The United States existed September 9th, 1850 until January 6th, 1912 when it was admitted to the Union of the United States, or the uh, Union as the state of New Mexico, making it the longest lived incorporated territory of the United States until Puerto Rico uh, and, uh, and the Virgin Islands. That lasted about 62 years. It was carved into uh, New Mexico and Arizona. Uh, the Arizona Organic Act was an organic act passed by the 37th Congress on March 12th, 1862 by the representative James M. Ashley of Ohio. The act provided for the creation of the Arizona Territory by dividing the New Mexico Territory into two territories along the current uh, boundary of New Mexico and Arizona. That is Seattle, Washington. That is uh, the Pike Market up in Seattle on one of those rare days in Seattle where there's no rain and there are no clouds in the sky. The Washington Territory, they split from the Oregon Territory and uh, that lasted March 2nd, uh, 1853 until November 11th, 1899. That territory was admitted to the Union as the state of Washington and included the uh, entirety of the modern uh, Idaho and parts of Montana and Wyoming and the official boundaries were drawn up in 1863 and uh, Idaho became its own territory 
and there is the city of uh, Corlane, Corlane. Hang on one second here. Uh, uh, when was it? You know what? It's probably never. It's probably never been eliminated. Um, it just um, kind of faded into oblivion. Um, obviously, uh, African Americans um, did live there, but there were no re repercussions, none whatsoever. Uh, African Americans would go there eventually. Coeur d'Alene, sanitary sewer. Eh, best picture I can have with something from uh, Idaho. Uh, the territory of Idaho was organized and incorporated uh, as part of the United States um, March 3rd, 1863 through July 3rd, 1890. And it was admitted into the Union as the territory of Idaho. Uh, here is Alaska, and this is Anchorage, Alaska. So if you try to figure out where you are, uh, here in New York, it's 3,500 miles, not too much longer than going out to California, 5,000 miles to Miami. That's a long trip to Miami. In fact, it's closer to London because you, know, you, you go over the pole, uh, flying from uh, Anchorage to, Lon uh, to London than it is to uh, uh, Miami. Uh, now, how did Alaska become part of the United States? Well, yeah, well, it was part of Russia for a long time. It was part of Russia until the 1860s. And Russian officials are beginning to worry that United States settlers might decide to go up to Alaska one day. And they also uh, felt that, uh, you know, if that happens, uh, they couldn't defend the colony because and Great Britain might decide to come in and take over. And uh, um, the Soviets, rather the Russians, had lost to the Brits uh, in the Crimea, Crimean War, 1853. And there was a lot of debt, an awful lot of debt. And maybe, maybe, maybe it's time to cut loose. Oh, those are the bald eagles. That's Sitka, Alaska. I took a picture of those bald eagles. It's nice that I have a camera that I could uh, zoom in, really zoom in. I got the bald eagles. On uh, March 30th, 1867, the U.S. Secretary of State, William Seward, who's got that high school down in lower Manhattan, that uh, Seward High School that was attended by a student by the name of Bernie Schwartz, you might know him better as Tony Curtis, uh, signed a treaty with Russia and purchased Alaska for $7 million. And, um, oh, he, he took it in the media. Uh, the media called it uh, Seward's Folly, Seward's Icebox. And, uh, and President Andrew Johnson called it a polar bear garden. But the United States now had it. Part of it, they wanted to keep it away from the Brits because the Brits did have all that territory that uh, abutted the Alaska Territory, uh, which is now known as uh, the Yukon. Uh, and there's Sitka. Uh, that is the last Russian capital. I was there in, uh, what was I there? Uh, July 4th, uh, 2019 or 2018. I spent the 4th of July in Sitka. And there are still some buildings that have Russian design in uh, Sitka. Uh, the territory of Alaska or the Alaska Territory was uh, an organized incorporated territory of the United States. It existed from uh, April 24th. 1912 until January uh, the 3rd, 1959. Oh, thank you, Todd. I appreciate that. Uh, have uh, Edith, rather. Uh, thank you, and I'm um, glad you enjoyed it. Only about five more minutes to go. So anyway, so uh, it, it, it existed from uh, 1912 to 1959. It's admitted into the Union as the state of Alaska, the territory created as the District of Alaska. Uh, May 17th, uh, 1884. Uh, and Aloha, Aloha from Oahu. And uh, that is Mark Twain actually was there. Uh, there's a little plaque there. Mark Twain was there and he wrote a story about this, this view. Hawaii is one of four U.S. states that started out as an independent country. The M Vermont Republic, 1791. Uh, the Republic of Texas. 1845, uh, the California Republic, Republic of Texas and California Republic came out of Mexico, and they were independent nations prior to statehood. Uh, along with Texas, Hawaii had a formal and an international diplomatic recognition as a nation, and that is a Hawaiian sunrise, sunrise. 
1893, the queen, uh, Lily Alana, announced plans for a new constitution. On January 14, 1893, a group of mostly Euro-American business leaders and residents formed a committee called the Committee of Safety to uh, stage a coup d'etat against the kingdom and become part of the United States. Sugar is king. And uh, they knocked off the queen. Uh, this guy, Sanford D. Dole, you might know Dole Pineapples. That may ring a bell. Uh, he's an American lawyer. Dole would win, Grover Cleveland would lose. Uh, he's an American lawyer who would become the president of the Republic when the provisional government of Hawaii ended on July 4th, 1894. Now, Grover Cleveland, who is the 24th and 22nd, 24th president of the United States, he's got uh, that little birthplace museum down uh, in West Caldwell, New Jersey. Um, they commissioned a report to see how did the queen get knocked down? Uh, the U.S. government initially told Dole, hey, reinstate the queen. The provisional government, which really had no power, but grab power, said, no, 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 don't worry about it. We got this. Uh, there's the Waimea uh, Canyon on uh, Kuala. Um, in uh, 1898, the Republic of Hawaii was annexed by the United States, became the territory of Hawaii, aided by the local sugar interests. The Hawaiian territory lasted 61 years, from uh, August 12, 1898, till August 21st, uh, 1959. Uh, the territory was admitted as the 50th state, the state of Hawaii, in 1960. Uh, it was, and there's my son in front of the uh, McKinley statue in Buffalo, New York. McKinley killed in Buffalo in 1901, assassinated, and my son was looking at uh, colleges at that time. Uh, anyway, uh, the Hawaii Territory, the United States Congress agreed to grant Hawaii a popularly elected government. Uh, President William McKinley signed the law an act to provide a government for the territory of Hawaii, also known as the Hawaiian Organic Act of 1900, which established the office of the territorial governor. The United States just takes over this place after Dole just knocks off the queen. And uh, the, the palace where the queen was knocked off uh, became the uh, head or the capital of uh, the territory. Uh, Hawaii was granted self-governance and retained the uh, Ilana Palace as its territorial capital building. Uh, the plantation owners and the capitalists maintained control of the financial institutions. And uh, the territory was great for uh, the sugar people because they had cheap foreign labor, uh, immigration and labor practices uh, that were prohibited in many states could go on in the territory of Hawaii. Uh, there would be a non-voting delegate to the United States Congress who was seated, and um, yeah, Hawaiians would get some offices and other rights and, and privileges or in office uh, granted a U.S. representative in the House of Representatives, except that person couldn't vote. The annexation of Hawaii to the United States made the selling of agricultural products to the mainland much more profitable because there'd be no tariffs. Hawaii used to be an independent country, so it was knocked off by Dole and uh, his sugar people. Workers began to discover, though, that they had rights in the 1920 first multicultural strike against you know, pineapples and all the other stuff that uh, was being grown there uh, against the uh, owners. Uh, shifting political alliances between 1902 and 1930 permitted Cuba to have a larger share of the United States sugar market. Uh, and um, there was a 45% domestic quota, uh, while uh, the Philippines and, and Puerto Rico, that was in Hawaii, uh, had 25%, Philippines, of course, being part of the United States. Uh, Pearl Harbor would come around. Americans would begin to realize where Hawaii was, which is just a speck in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Uh, that is uh, the memorial to the US, Arizona, USS Arizona. Uh, in 1993, about a century afterwards, the United States Congress passed a joint apology resolution 
regarding the overthrow of the Queen. It was signed into uh, law, or the uh, Bill Clinton signed the apology. The uh, resolution apologized for the overthrow of the Hawaiian Kingdom and acknowledged that the United States had uh, annexed Hawaii unlawfully. There are some people in Hawaii that are looking to uh, get back to the Republic of Hawaii, but uh, there's not really all that much uh, behind it. You see, when you go to Hawaii, you'll see some signs on light posts saying, give us back Hawaii or join this group or join that group. Uh, that is uh, the governor of Hawaii back in 2005, Linda Lingle. Hawaii has been a rather interesting place because from day one, as a state, uh, they have had no problems with women uh, in elected offices. And uh, Linda Lingle came from St. Louis and ended up uh, in Hawaii. We got to talk uh, a lot about uh, how she ended up in Hawaii. And um, I didn't get laid by her, but I had that other thing around my neck. Um, she, offered to, uh, she offered to lay me with the lay, but it didn't happen and it was okay. Anyway, that is Linda Lingle, who was the uh, governor of Hawaii. Uh, some former territories, there is Cologne looking at uh, where the Atlantic Ocean and the uh, Caribbean Sea converge. The former territories, Cuba, very short-lived, uh, 1898 to 1902. The Panama Canal Zone, that was uh, Cologne, 1904 to 1976 in the Philippines, uh, the United States let it go after World War II. That is the Hubbard Glacier up in Alaska, which is shrinking in size. Uh, that is one of the things that uh, the United States acquired when they got Russia. So what's going on now as we wrap this up? Well, statehood, the last territories to become states a long time ago, a very long time ago, 1959, Alaska, 1960, Hawaii. Washington, D.C. has statehood advocates. On November 8, 2016, the District of Columbia voted overwhelmingly in favor of statehood with 86% of the voters approving the proposal. Right now, uh, the uh, Washington, D.C. proposal is five votes short of passing. Uh, the district's future could be determined sooner than later by the state uh, Senate. Puerto Rico's future, future status is still being debated. None of the other territories right now are seeking statehood. Uh, although Guam, you know, yeah, there, there are proposals being kicked around Guam. Uh, nothing really, last time I was in the uh, Virgin Islands was two years ago, so nothing really going on in the Virgin Islands. Uh, like I said, Guam is kicking it around. And uh, the two that really are advocating right now for statehood, uh, most of Washington, D.C., and some people in Puerto Rico. I want to thank uh, Anna for inviting me. And uh, if you have any questions, any comments, uh, it's your turn to speak. You can unmute yourself. Questions, comments? Very comprehensive. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, uh, I, I learned a whole lot uh, from you. Um, I never really thought much, uh, even though I know, you know about the other states and they had a, a, a time period when they were uh, placed in the union, the United States. But I, for some reason, you know, that it was so long ago that I wasn't thinking of them in the same terms of the present day territories. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Ronnie, appreciate that. Anybody else? Anybody in favor of Washington becoming a state? Jack is. I can't see the rest of the people, so Jack is. So, well, they're debating it right now. That's that's what's going on right now. The debate is taking place. Any, anything to get two more Democratic senators? Well, that you know what? That was never a consideration, really, uh, in some of those territories. They just brought them in. But then again, if you look at the history of uh, the War of 1812, those senators in 1812 were looking to expand westward. It's part of the reason there was a war between the Brits and, and the Americans. Um, yeah, it's become political. 
right now. And uh, is it best for the people? I don't think the uh, senators care either way. Mm. Yeah, they care about themselves. I've covered politics for a very long time. And I can tell you one thing, they care more about themselves and their position than, in my opinion, than actually legislation in a lot of areas. But that's just me, my perspective from going back to Daniel Patrick Moynihan back, uh, remember he was elected in 1978. So Moynihan, D'Amato, some of the others that I dealt with over the years. Jack, you got to put on your microphone. Are you weren't saying anything? Okay. Anybody else? Well, thank you, uh, Margarita. I appreciate that. Uh, thank you, uh, Miriam. And I think that's it. I think we've we've done our hour. Wow. Thank you for putting it together in such a concise way. You know, yeah. there's a lot more to be learned from the information that you gave, you know, it's a re it can spark people into looking back into history to learn more about how things happen. Thank you, Claire. Uh, Hawaii is fascinating. I mean, I do a talk on the cruise ships about the sugar industry and and Dole and and the Queen and um, and the Queen actually that uh, that oh, the song and I I don't know the name of it, but da 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 da, da that she wrote that song. Uh, in, 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 in sorrow because she lost, she saw, you know, the, the Hawaiian Republic go and it was knocked off by a bunch of business guys who wanted uh, pineapples and whatever else they, and the mm -hmm. sugar. And sugar didn't last long. Uh, but I do a whole talk on when sugar was king. Mm -hmm. I haven't done that in a long time, but you got to do it in the Caribbean and you got to do it in Hawaii. And it's really, really interesting, uh, the whole story of sugar. Mm. So. I think pineapple is number one in uh, now in uh, Costa Rica. Is it? Is yeah. It? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I went to a banana plantation in Costa Rica. Mm -hmm. It was interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Gwendolyn. <laughs> you had been my history teacher. See, but I could tell these stories because I was never in the classroom. Uh, just Claire, just go up to uh, look me up on uh, Apple uh, iTunes and you can find what I got. Uh, is the pineapple, I have no idea whether the pineapple is a symbol of hospitality. Um, you, know, uh, Gwen, uh, you know, Dr. Wiggins, um, as, as my friend Dan Rasher, who I wrote a book with or helped write a book with many, many years ago, who's an economist, University of San Francisco, he said, the reason we well, worked well together is I'm up here in the Ivy Towers uh, and you're down in the streets. <laughs> You're down in the streets in the pavement. He said, I, I couldn't do what you did because you have that experience in the pavement. Mm -hmm. So, you know, teachers don't have that experience. So, mm -hmm. you know. Anyway, so is that it? That's, That's it. Good. Thank you. Okay, so we'll uh, hopefully talk to you in the future. Uh, if anybody's interested, I have a baseball talk in about two hours at the uh, library in New Jersey, but it's up on my website somewhere. Um, anyway, thank you so much, and uh, we'll see you down the road. So everybody stay safe, stay healthy, enjoy when the weather turns a little nicer, and uh, we'll see you down the line. My name's Evan Weiner. Have a good day, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, Evan. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.